Um, appreciate you all coming out on a 9 a.m. after a party on Friday. Uh, I want a beer because there's more than 20 people in here, so that's uh, that's a, my first one of the day. Um, my name is Bill Volks, and I'm going to be talking about privilege access workstations and some other ways to limit financial theft and lateral movement uh, in your networks. Uh, a little bit about me. I'm a blue teamer on Twitter. I work in the financial sector for a small company. About 100 employees in 10 locations. Um, I, uh, you know, working for a small company usually means you wear a lot of hats. And, uh, you know, I do everything from configuring networking equipment to vendor management to daily sysadmin stuff and a little bit of physical security and uh, just a wide range of different things. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm truly blessed. I'm one of those uh, people that I truly love what I do for a living, like a lot of you guys probably. I'm pretty passionate about it. And one of my favorite things to do is to learn offensive techniques, bring them back to my network, um, kind of take them apart, figure out countermeasures for them and uh, detection mechanisms and things like that. Uh, so in my free time, uh, I like to build stuff with my hands. You know, as IT people, we don't always get to see the tangible thing that we built. And uh, I just think there's something really cool about, you know, stepping back after a long day of work and you you see that cool thing that you built. This summer I built a pirate ship with my kids in my backyard, which was a lot of fun. Um, I also like to brew my own beer and cook. Yeah, home brew. Um, and also do a, lots of cooking and stuff on the grill. Okay, so let's start here by talking about a typical attack scenario on a Windows network. Um, in this first case, let's say that the organization might not be very security conscious. Uh, most of their users are going to be running as local admin, and one of them gets popped with a phishing email. Um, now the attacker is going to be running as local admin. They can migrate to system, dump credentials, and you know it's probably not all the realm of possibility that uh, the IT admin set the admin, local admin password the same for for all their workstations just to make their lives easier. Um, and if they did that, the attacker can obviously, he can use that local credential to log in, move laterally throughout the, all those workstations that have that password, uh, until they find another workstation where maybe a domain, domain admin has logged in, they can steal those credentials uh, through various ways. So it's a pretty quick path to game over. Okay, in the next scenario, let's say that they're a little more security conscious. Uh, most of their users are running as standard users. Uh, and same situation, user gets popped uh, by a phishing email. And now this time the attacker is running as a standard user. So they're going to need to be able to uh, escalate privileges so that they can get to local admin and then system so that they can you know, dump credentials, steal tokens, and things like that. Um, and one way to do that, they may use something like HarmJoy's uh, power-up tool to look for common misconfigurations on the system they allow them to escalate privileges. Um, you know, if, if they don't see an easy way to do that, they might move laterally with those standard creds and look for more misconfigurations, just trying to find one that'll, that'll work for them. And while they're doing that, you know, they'll probably be looking for credentials that are just on the network. So maybe the admin team left a unattend.xml file that they were using to deploy images for um, PCs, or maybe they deploy passwords to the group policy preferences an attacker could get um, the password that way, but one way or another, they're going to they're going to keep moving around laterally, um, stealing credentials until they either get domain admin or uh, some kind of privileged credential, or until they get what they're looking for. So you know these scenarios are certainly not all all encompassing, but I think they do follow a pretty common path on a Windows network that an attacker might take. And like I said, domain admin may not be the end goal. Uh, if, if they find what they're looking for on an open share from a standard, the first box they pop, which is a standard user, um, they may not care about domain admin, but um, the, the point here is that the attacker tactics tend to revolve around finding and using existing credentials on a network. And if you want to see a really good demo of how attackers do that, uh, how, they, how they move laterally and sniff out credentials, check out uh, Will Schrader and Andy Robbins' um, talk from B-Sides Las Vegas on Bloodhound, some really cool stuff there. 
But the main goal of these privilege access workstations is, is to limit this exposure, right? Uh, but in order to do that, you need to understand where credentials are stored, in what form they're stored, and then you, it's good to know some of the other issues with uh, Windows authentication and credentials. So to start off here, to give you a little background, like for Windows logon types, there's different logon types within Windows, you know, when you, when you log on the system. Um, interactive would be like when you actually type your password into like the console or um, when you type your password in the computer, that's going to be interactive. And there's a bunch of other logon types. But the, the key thing to take away here is that all of them, except for the network logon type, are going to leave some form of reusable credential when you use it. So that's a pretty key thing to take away here as we're moving along. And network logon types are going to be things like um, net use from a command prompt, uh, PowerShell remoting, remote registry, using a, a MMC snap ins to connect to remote machines. All those are, are not, they're not going to leave any reusable credentials on the system that you connect to. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about where credentials are stored on Windows. Uh, the, one of the more commonly known ones is a lo like local SAM database, which is a file on a local computers that has, you know, the, all the local user accounts and then their hashes that are associated with them. And these can be dumped with system rights and, uh, you know, which is pretty trivial to get once you have local admin. Once you, once they're dumped, they can be brute forced offline or, or passed to other systems. Which we'll get into in a little bit. You know, Active Directory database, pretty pretty basic stuff here. I think most people know, but just kind of covering where all the credentials are stored. Um, Active Directory database, same thing. Only it's uh, credentials for all users in the domain. Um, now, read-only domain controllers by default aren't going to store privileged credentials, uh, but uh, they'll only have a subset of of, of the of the da database in there, but. I'm not going to get too deep into diving into Active Directory and uh, domain controller security, but it is it is good to remember that's a, another crucial concept to consider. Uh, credentials stored in LSAS were made famous by tools like Mimikatz and Windows Credential Editor, and uh, you know they those tools pull pull the credentials from memory of that process. When a user logs onto a system, LSAS will cache your credentials. Um, so when when, when after you log on, when you go to access a network resource, uh, you're not having to type your password in every time. And uh, these can be stored as hashes, Kerberos tickets, or just the actual plain text password. So prior to Windows 8.1, Server 2012, um, LSAS stored a lot of credentials in memory. Um, as you can see here, they've made a lot of progress in that department. Um, you know, this chart actually comes from the second past the hash white paper from Microsoft, but it was originally adapted from a Twitter post by Benjamin Delpy, who's the creator of Mimikatz. And I find that kind of fitting because, you know, it's because of people like, like Ben and um, other people in the community, you know, like uh, Chris Campbell and um, Skip Duckwall and, other, and lots of other people that have really brought these issues in the spotlight and kind of forced Microsoft to give us more tools to mitigate these issues. So I just want to kind of point that out and say thank you to everybody that was involved in that. But uh, this KB287-1997, also known as Mimikatz um, KB by some, uh, was released in 2014. And it gave us a lot of the controls that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, for example, as long as that update's installed on a Windows um, 7 uh, computer, the only plain text credential is going to be the W Digest. Um, provider in LSAS. Um, for Windows 8.1 and above, there's going to be no plain text credentials stored uh, by default, but there are some caveats to this. Uh, it's, it, it is going to store NT hash and Kerberos tickets for domain uh, domain accounts for, win for Windows 7 or Windows 8.1 and above. And also, the third third party SSP might store some third party software might store credentials uh, in, in LSAS as well. Uh, this 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 uh, screenshot here from the uh, Mimikatz GitHub page has a whole bunch of really good stuff on it. Some caveats to the plain text credentials. Um, if you're if it's a domain computer and the, it can't access the domain controller, the Kerberos provider might store some credentials in memory. Um, although Windows 8.1 and above does not store plain text credentials in memory by default, it can be re-enabled 
with a uh, registry key, registry edit, and a reboot. Um, similarly, Windows 7 uh, W Digest can be disabled by a registry edit and a reboot too. Um, and th these um, highlighted uh, registry keys here, if these have certain values in them, it also might store some plain text credentials in, in memory. Um, for example, if the organization has a group policy that sets um, allow delegating default credentials for uh, for auto logon and for like remote applications for terminal server, that will also store um, that'll put some keys into those registry keys that I highlighted in the last slide that will store plain text credentials in the TSP KG provider for LSAS. So a good thing to keep in mind there. Um, LSA secrets are going to be data that's only accessible uh, to the system process. Some of these are going to be uh, credentials that are encrypted and stored on disk. This is going to be things like scheduled task passwords, computer account passwords, service account passwords, and uh, also cache, what we typically call cache credentials, which Microsoft calls password verifiers, are stored in LSA secrets. And these are stored as salted hashes. And uh, these can't be passed in a pass the hash attack. Um, but they can be dumped in brute force. And you know, the cache credentials being that when you bring your computer home and can't talk to the domain controller, you're able to log in with that account because it's cached on the system. There's also a credential manager where passwords can be entered manually in the control panel. Or when you tell Windows to remember your RDP password, um, it'll store it there. These are encrypted with a key that comes from your that user's password, and any user that's any program that's running as that user can access those. And uh, it, there's actually a, a Metasploit post module that will dump those out, I believe. Okay, so that's kind of where credentials are stored. Some of the common issues with Windows credentials, you know, I think we're all pretty familiar with pass the hash. If you're not, there's a ton of documentation on the internet with will be in my references. Um, you know, NTLM hashes can be acquired from various various ways, whether it be pulling them from memory with something like Mimikatz or Windows Credential Editor, or dumping them from the, from the local SAM or the Active Directory database. And once they have the hash, you can authenticate just as Windows does uh, an illegitimate logon in the background by passing it to other systems on the network. And when you log on via NTLM, NTLM there's a different, couple different flavors of the protocols that it uses. And it does a challenge response uh, mechanism that uh, proves that the user knows their password hash, basically. And there's a couple different flavors of that. There's NTLM v1, which is completely broken. Uh, if an attacker can capture the traffic on the wire, uh, they can they can recover the hash. NTLM2 a little bit better, but still has has issues, can be brute forced. And both of these are vulnerable to relay attacks, which I believe can be partially mitigated by SMB signing, but not totally. Uh, similar issues with Kerberos, you know, you can dump a ticket from one computer, load it onto another computer, also known as pass the ticket. Um, the ticket tickets technically expire, but they can be uh, if, if the expired ticket gets presented, they can be they can be extended. And uh, there's other issues with Kerberos, you know, like golden ticket and silver ticket, which are kind of out of scope for today, but still we didn't know about. So you know, the things we talked about so far, credentials in memory. Um, pass the hash, pass the ticket. Uh, I think they're all pretty well known among the blue team. Um, now, but Windows, I think the same can't be true said about uh, Windows access tokens. Um, I remember I did a class a few years ago with Dave Kennedy, and you know we he showed us how to use incognito, steal tokens, and to print uh, privileged users. But I really didn't grasp fully what I was really doing. Uh, and to be honest with you, I didn't really know. Windows access tokens existed until fairly recently. Um, but to kind of quickly explain or go over what Windows access tokens are, when you log into a system, it verifies your password, uh, checks if your password is okay. Um, if, the pass if your password is okay, the uh, token gets created, and every process that gets executed on behalf of that user is going to have a copy of that token. And the, token, the tokens get stored in memory, and they basically enable uh, si single sign-on functionality within Windows. So there's a couple different types of these tokens. There's impersonation tokens. And if you saw the, the Rotten Potato talk yesterday, they are talking about impersonation tokens there. Um, these are generated by non-interactive logons. Um, these can be used to escalate privileges, but they can only be used locally. And then there's delegation tokens, which are 
used, uh, generated by interactive logons, and these are really the ones that uh, an attacker wants to get because um, if an attacker can steal a delegation token, they have a privileged user, they can use that user credentials to log on to any network accessible system. So is everybody pretty familiar with incognito and how, and how it works to steal tokens, or have you guys used that before? Yeah? Um, I don't, it doesn't seem to be super well known among um, defenders, so I just wanted to go real quick, uh, a little demo on what it looks like to um, go from local admin to domain admin by stealing tokens. Um, so you can see here we've got an interpreter shell running as local admin. Um, you know, we could have got this multiple ways, let's just say it's a phishing email. And uh, now in order to steal or uh, list tokens, we need to be running a system. And so, you know, you one way to do that, you um, migrate to a process that's currently running a system, and then you become you become running a system too. So this pro this this example, I, I migrated the win logon process. And now for the, on the victim computer, I opened up a computer management box, um, and in the UAC prompt, I typed in my domain admin credentials, and uh, then I closed the computer management box. Now that that left that token of that user on the system. So now when the when the attacker lists out the tokens, he sees the do, this uh, account that's in the blue team domain uh, domain admin account, and it's as simple as you know impersonate token, and then you steal that token, and you are able to use it on the network to access any uh, any system on the network with those credentials. Now, um, one thing I didn't know until I was kind of preparing for this talk is that the incognito has been around for a really long time. Um, it was presented. It was written by and presented by a guy named Luke Jennings in DEF CON 15, and um, I know I'm kind of late to the party on this, but uh, his white paper that he wrote for, for like nine years ago, it still rings true today. And uh, uh, if you go, if, if he's advocating for a lot of the same things that I'm talking about today. So if you haven't checked that out, it's still worth a read, even though it's you know nine years old. Um, so, you know, credential theft is, has been a major issue for a long time. Even in that white paper, he talks about how, you know, this is nothing new. This has been, this has been a, an issue for a long time. Um, but there's a couple major roadblocks we need to overcome to, to combat these issues. Uh, number one thing, um, IT admins and other people that may not consider themselves, you know, security people, they don't, they might not truly understand the risk of what we're talking about. Um, also, you know, change is hard. And uh, usability ch tends to trump security. Um, you know, as Luke Jennings said in that white paper, and Chris Campbell and Skip Duckwall echoed in their Black Hat paper from a couple years ago, there's there's no patch from these for these issues. Um, you know, it's a, an expected consequence of a single sign-on implementation. And uh, without single sign-on, you have to type your password in you know ten times just when your system boots up, right? So. You know, but there is kind of a light at the end of the tunnel here. Um, we're getting, we have more controls th than ever before to kind of mitigate some of this stuff. And uh, it's going to provide so much more value uh, by using some of these controls than any next-gen blinky box that you can go buy. Uh, and one of, the, one of those controls is using um, privileged access workstations. So privileged access workstations or PAWS, um, you know, the, the concept as far as I'm aware, um, was kind of outlined in the first pass of the hash white paper from Microsoft, and then it was kind of it was expanded upon in a TechNet article from earlier this year. And it could be a much older concept of that; it probably is. But the first I had heard about it was that TechNet article. But at the most basic level, um, they're hardened admin workstations that are designed to limit your exposure to the types of threats and things we were just talking about. Um, so. If, if your goal is to limit how often privileged credentials get left on systems for attackers to steal, how do you go about how do you go about doing that? Um, I like to think of it and compare it to network segmentation, where you want to you want to isolate those privileged credentials and keep them off and away from riskier systems and riskier users. Um, and to do that, you need to group the systems and users by privilege level. So the TechNet article references this administrative or Active Directory administrative tier model. And basically, what this is is it just splits up users and, compu and computers 
um, into different levels of uh, different tiers of access. So you've got tier zero, which is going to be your domain admins, domain controllers. If your domain controllers are virtualized, it's going to be any admin that can administer the virtualized infrastructure. There's tier one, which is going to be your anything that has uh, control over uh, mission critical applications. That's going to be member server admins, member servers, um, enterprise application uh, admins. And then there's tier two, which is going to be your, your user devices and any accounts that have control over the user devices. So the idea here is that um, you have your domain admin account should never log into anything other than a domain controller. You stay in that same tier. Your member server admin should should never log into a, a standard user workstation. And um, on a similar thought here, you never log in to a domain controller from the same computer that you're looking at cat memes and um, checking your email and things like that. Um, because once your if your admin state workstation gets compromised, so does anything else that you administer from there, right? And that's the that's the, that's a really key thing to understand. So you know, tra traditional solutions to this problem are can be inherently flawed and flawed depending on how they were implemented. If you're accessing an admin jump server from a user workstation that you browse the internet and check email from, you got the same problem that we just talked about. Um, now you can use admin uh, jump servers. Uh, pod deployment, but you're going to want to make sure anybody that's accessing them is doing it from a hardened workstation. <clears throat> now, before you go start uh, um, configuring hardened workstations, um, there's some prerequisites you're going to want to consider before you do that. Um, um, first of all, if you're if most of your users are running as local admin, you're going to want to tackle that problem first, right? Um, that can be a difficult thing to accomplish. Um, depending on how much you know management buys in just security, the types of legacy applications you run, and things like that. Um, but you know, don't give up if you have a subset of users that you just can't figure out how to get them running as standard users. Don't give up because there's so much, there's a ton of value in getting as few people running as local admin as you possibly can. You know, you want to you want to make it harder for the attacker to go from standard. They want to make them go from standard user to local admin and then the system. And um, if you have legacy applications that maybe not, don't play well with user account control, um, you can uh, you, you think about some workarounds you can do. Maybe you can run a, run that application in a terminal server. Um, you know, if you need to um, put some pressure on that a vendor, uh, if you need more pull with the vendor, maybe team up with other customers of the vendor to try to get them to fix their software. Um, and you can also split up their accounts, give them a standard user and a, and a local admin account, and try to force them to use the standard user account and only the, the, the local admin when they, when they need to escalate. You can put the local admin account into the protected users group, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. Um, so all, you know, your, your, your IT help desk people are going to be running as standard users, too. And uh, when they only use their local admin when they need to. And, uh, if you do have some of that group of users that are non-IT that need, be, need separate accounts for standard and local admin, make sure they're the only local admin on their, their box and not every box. Uh, and the next thing you're going to do is, uh, you know, some, a lot of small companies, they just use domain admin to administer everything, which is a big uh, no-no. Um, so break out, your, break out your admins into like member server admins. And also, you're going to want to limit your domain admins to as few as you possibly can get. Um, you know, delegate privileges in AD as, as you need to. And it's also a good idea, if you can, to segment each group of admins. So if you've got a, if you've got a couple of admins that only need access to a, an operations, a couple operations servers, you make them their own, you make them their own group. So the, um, the, the TechNet article lifts out a couple uh, phases of deployment here. Um, phase one is going to be immediate deployment to Active Directory admins. This is going to be get you up and running using pause as quickly as you can to, to uh, help out your most privileged accounts. Um, phase two is going to be extending um, pause to all users with uh, mission, that are admins over mission critical applications. It's going to be things like member server admins, cloud services admins. And then there's phase three is going to be advanced pause security which is going to be adding some additional controls, which I'll, I'll talk about. 
So for the deployment models, the, there's a couple recommended deployment models. Um, the first one being dedicated hardware, which is going to be where you give admins a dedicated workstation, whether it be a laptop or a desktop, and um, they have one that's their standard user system. They only use their standard user account to log into that. They, that's where they check email, browse the internet, things like that. Then they have a totally separate system that they use for administration. They log in with their privileged credential, and they're, they're not local admins on that box. Uh, they can't browse the internet. Uh, and um, so there's some, so there's some pros with the dedicated hardware model. It's obviously got the strongest security separation because they're two separate systems. Um, but the, the drawbacks, takes up more desk space. It's more weight to haul around, if, uh, especially if it's laptop. And it's double the hardware cost. The other model is simultaneous use. So this will be a hardened um, host machine will be your uh, PA, and you'll have a local, either a local VM that is your standard user system, or you'll access a, uh, a VM on like a, with VDI or RDP or something like that, but in a centralized place. And uh, so the, con the pros there, it's obviously lower hardware cost, better user experience, and the drawback is, you know, when you have a single keyboard and mouse, you can tend to type the wrong password into the wrong system, maybe. You know, it's just easier to make those errors. And also, you don't have that separation as you would with the dedicated hardware. So for the simultaneous use model, you know, you can either have that local, uh, a VM locally on the hardened PA um, that's your standard user system, or you can have access it through VDI or they're managed centrally. You know, the drawback of the VDI method is that if you're offline or you can't access that data center, uh, you can't do your standard user activities until you can access that. So you'd have to be always connected to that. Um, now, when I start talking about this model with other IT people, they tend to say, well, why can't I just have a, you know, my regular user workstation and have an admin VM on it? It just seems like that makes more sense. It's more convenient. Um, but that, that brings us back to the same issue we were just talking about, where your user workstation gets compromised and um, anything that you administer from there is, is also could be compromised as well. Whereas if you flip that around and your, your user VM gets compromised, um, in order to get back to the host, you'd need you know, a VM um, escape exploit or something like that, which I'm sure is feasible, but going to be a lot harder to do. <clears throat> so once you've chosen your deployment model, and you can mix and match that, obviously, to, to your environment and what your admins prefer, um, you can uh, use a couple of PowerShell scripts that, the, that actually Microsoft um, has out on TechNet. And uh, so one will create the new OU structure, one will create the new security groups, put them in the right OUs, and one will assign uh, permissions to the OUs, put them in the right groups. Um, and so when, it, when you get the no, new OUs created, the meat and potatoes of where you're going to be working is the admin um, top level, the newly created admin top level uh, OU. And th it creates some other OUs too, but mostly what you're going to be working in is the admin OU. And that underneath that, there's going to be tier 0, tier 1, tier 2. And then account underneath each one of those, there's accounts, devices, groups, and service accounts. And I'm just going to quickly go over the tier one OU. So in the in the accounts OU under tier one, um, this is going to be you're going to put users that are members of domain admins, um, enterprise admins, or equivalent in that OU. In the devices OU, you're going to put your your PA computer accounts. That's going to be the computer accounts that are that are PAs in tier zero. And then under groups, you're going to have there's some new groups that were created in there, and uh, the PA users group is going to be the actual users that log on locally to the to the workstations. Um, now these are not going to be local admins on those systems. The uh, the PA maintenance group is going to be local admin. If you need to log in to troubleshoot it or whatever, you know you're going to rarely use that, but that's that 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 group is going to be the local admin on the system, and. Uh, um, it's, it's important to note, too, a user should never be a member of both PA users and PA maintenance. So keep that in mind. So uh, once you have the OU framework laid out, you can start working on group policies that are going to harden the, harden the devices. Um, these are some of the ones that are listed out in the TechNet article. And you could obviously expand on this and, and do more. But 
Um, first thing that you'll do is an empty user group policy to empty all local groups. And just put in uh, the POM maintenance and the local administrator account into the local admins group. You, you can grant uh, the PAW users group local login access to the PAW. And uh, then you can use Windows firewall rules to block all unsolicited inbound traffic. Um, you can use you can have a whitelist for certain IPs that you may be used for patch management, um, security scanning, things like that. And then you can configure WSS to automatically install Windows updates. Uh, for the user GPOs, um, you're going to want to block internet access for all PAW users, that, that group that was created. Um, you can do that through you know, group policy, through Internet Explorer, proxy settings, or you can use whatever you already have in place, you know, if you have a proxy server, or Windows security, um, web security, whatever you use for that. Um, you're also going to want to restrict administrators from logging on to lower tier posts. And you can do that with uh, the deny logon rights. So basically, you know, you have your tier zero accounts. They should not be allowed to log on to your tier one systems or your tier two systems. And then you have your tier one accounts that shouldn't be allowed to log on to uh, user workstations. You can use those login, the login right GPO to, to do that. So once you have all the policies and the OU all, all set up, the framework's kind of ready to go, you can start working on your actual hardware. And when you do that, you can you might want to consider your supply chain and how much you trust your, you know, the manufacturer and uh, suppliers and their security practices of your actual hardware that you're getting. You're going to want to acquire your installation media. Um, so if you can use Windows 10 Enterprise, that'd be ideal uh, so that you can take advantage of things like Credential Guard and Vice Guard. You can use Windows 10 Pro too. You just won't, you won't be able to use those things. So keep that in mind. Um, you can, then you can set a unique complex password up for the local admin account. Um, my clicker just died. Um, you can connect to the pod of the network, uh, join the domain, move it to the right OU, install Windows updates, and any necessary admin tools. And when you, for the admin tools and the installation media, you're going to want to obviously verify your integrity on that. And, um, you know, check the hashes, make sure they match. And for any admin tools that you install in the box, you're going to want to um, really carefully consider the risk and exposure that you're adding to that system. You only want to install stuff that you actually you absolutely need on there. And uh, then you can forward your logs to any SIM that you have or centralized log repository and then validate your hardening group policies. And then once you have these deployed to all Active Directory admins, that will be the, you'll be done with phase one. So phase two is going to be extending this out to all admins of mission critical applications. And uh, this is going to be things you know like member server admins, cloud services admins, um, uh, network admins, things like that. And in phase two, Microsoft recommends uh, enabling and enforcing restricted admin mode for uh, remote desktop connections. And, you know, this is kind of a controversial thing. I think, um, you know, the, the, because ironically, when you enable restricted admin mode, you are uh, allowing, you're, you're allowing pass the hash, pass the hash via RDP to the system. Um, and, uh, you know, the benefit of restricted admin mode is that it leaves no reusable credentials. On the, on the systems that you're authenticating to, whereas a typical uh, remote desktop connection will leave it the uh, NT hash and Kerberos ticket. Um, but, uh, you, you know, you're going to want to weigh the risk versus reward here. And, you know, um, you know, the, in my mind, if you lock down RDP so you can only, you can only RDP from trusted hosts, enabling restricted admin mode, uh, the, the benefit in not leaving reusable credentials when you authenticate far outweighs any um, additional um, any additional risk that gets created by enabling uh, restricted admin mode. So if you do decide to use restricted admin mode, it's off by default. You need to enable it on destination systems with the registry edit. Um, 
to use it, you just use the restricted admin flag with RDP. And then to enforce it, you do the restricted restrict delegation of credentials to remote ser servers uh, group policy, and then you link that to any admin uh, computer will use. Now, a limitation of using restricted admin mode is that any when you connect to a system with restricted admin mode, uh, and then you connect to another system from that from there, you're going to be authenticating with the computer account of that remote system that you first logged into. So, you know, if you have like a network share or something like that. It's going to be using the computer account to log into that, so that's, you just want to keep that in mind. Um, then in phase two, you're also going to want to move, move objects to appropriate OUs, so tier one users, groups, and computer accounts. And then any, also, you want to also add users to the, the tier one admins group, so that's going to allow you to use group policy to restrict logging to lower tier devices. An optional step here is you can allow you can allow whitelisted internet destinations. So, like if you have uh, cloud services that you need to administer, or if you have a vendor that um, needs to be able to remote in to provide support for their application, um, you can whitelist their their internet destination on the pause. And, you know, tier one admins might need different tools than tier zero admins, so um, you're going to want to carefully consider the weigh the risks of each the tool that you're going to install on those. You can also enable a credential guard at this point. A credential guard is a, a fairly new technology that um, the idea is to virtualize Windows services that manage credentials. Um, and the idea is that you, you're you isolating. So if an attacker is running as a local admin with admin rights, they're not. the idea would be to not allow them to access those credentials. Yeah, but there are some requirements for that. Uh, you need Windows 10 Enterprise 64-bit. Um, you need to have Secure Boot enabled. And if, it, if, there, if the machine is a VM, it needs to be Hyper-V. And there's also a couple other requirements for that. So keep that in mind. So Phase 3 builds on Phase 1. It's really not dependent on Phase 2 at all. And it adds things like multi-factor authentication, uh, using smart cards, and uh, whitelisting with things like Device Guard and App Locker, which are really awesome controls. Um, I don't have time to dive into any of that, and they're fairly complex. But I'd recommend uh, for Device Guard, if, you can, if you're interested in, in looking at that, check out Matt Graber's uh, blog. He's got a lot of good stuff on there. Uh, also, I'll talk about protected users and uh, authentication policies and silos. So Windows two-factor authentication um, solutions, a great control. But you got to remember, they're not a magic bullet for this issue, for these issues. You know, they do have some limitations. Um, they're only enforced for interactive logons, and if you force smart card logons, the hash won't change for that account. Um, so, if an attacker gets uh, the hash of one of those accounts, they could use it to log on uh, with network logons. And now you can mitigate that by toggling the smart card required uh, setting. And you can you know, script that, obviously. But I believe that will invalidate any sessions that those users are currently in. So keep that in mind. So protected users group. This is one of my favorite controls. Um, I think mostly because it's the most painless to implement. Basically, just put users in the protected users group. And you, you get a whole bunch of good benefits from that. Um, most of your benefits of this are going to be are you going to be uh, given uh, once you're running 2012 R2 functional level, um, but you can you still get some a little bit of benefit if you're not quite there yet. And what this basically does is it'll it'll force Kerberos authentication, so you won't use NTLM at all, and it'll force using uh, AES for Kerberos. It'll take your ticket hours from 10 to 4. Your ticket your ticket will only last for four hours instead of 10. And if you when your ticket expires, it forces the user to re-log on, re-authenticate. Now, uh, and also in, in the little uh, graphic down there, the only thing stored in memory for LSAS is going to be the Kerberos ticket. And, you know, a feature or limitation, depending on how you look at it, uh, when a user is a member of a protected users group, it, the system, any system they log on to will not store any local cache credentials. So if you put your user into a, the PAW, into the, your PAW user into the protected user group, and then you go home and you're not able to hit the domain controller, uh, you won't be able to log on with that account. So, good thing to keep in mind there. 
so authentication policies and silos, these pair well with protected user group and they do require 2012 R2 functional level. Um, now this will do things like you can control where accounts log on, which services they can authenticate to, you can set kind of granular Kerberos ticket settings, and uh, it's a great control as well. Now some of the lessons learned from my deployment, um, I know not everyone shares this, but uh, Windows 10 Enterprise has been great for me. Um, I had a really good, really good experience with that, you know, using uh, local VM, you know, having dual monitors and a dock and the audio and microphone and copy and paste between host and VMs has been great. Also Hyper-V networking has been great. Um, you can easily put VMs into different VLANs. You can change from the private network to the wired network, the wireless network. Uh, I had really good luck with all that. But I'm not going to say that deploying pause is going to make anything easier for you. Um, you know, it, it really is a dramatic shift in the day-to-day -day of most IT admins. And, you know, even for a small company, you only have a handful or a couple of IT people. The number of privileged accounts you have to manage is, can be, seem kind of daunting. And uh, I even found myself kind of swearing at myself for making me, <laughs> making myself do this. But, um, you know, you just, you get used to it after a while. And the, the benefits are definitely worth it if you care about security in your environment. Um, so, and if you, you know, if you need, you just have to figure out what works for you. So if you need, if you can't remember all those passwords yourself, you might want to think about an enterprise password um, product or something, and you're obviously going to weigh, want to weigh the risk of that as well. But uh, you just need to figure out what works for you in your, in your organization. Also, you're going to probably want to enable in, internal web browsing, because it could probably be managing, um, you know, web GUIs of, of systems on your network. And if you do that, if you, if you block internet browsing with proxy settings and group policy, one way to do that is the proxy override group policy setting. And also I found it useful to script uh, virtual switch uh, config changes in high, using PowerShell, like if I'm switching locations, um, change, scripting those things to make it, make it faster. Okay, so that's kind of the pod deployment. Um, I'm going to switch gears here a little bit and talk about other things you can do to limit exposure to credential theft and lateral movement. And uh, the first one here being network segmentation. And, you know, I, I kind of compared privileged access workstations to um, to network segmentation. Um, in, you know, it's, in theory they're similar, um, but they're also, I've also found through my deployment that they also pair well with network segmentation. So, you know, if, in this, in this um, made up example here, if we have three offices and each office has a different subnet for different user groups, so you've got legal, accounting, HR, and IT, and um, you know, if you start talking about network segmentation, you start thinking about things like, okay, my accounting users in site one, do those PCs need to talk to uh, other users in accounting in site one? You know, I don't know. It depends on the business. There could be a reason, but probably not. Um, another situation would be like, uh, my users in legal in site three, do they need to walk, they need, do those computers need, need to be able to talk to any other computers in uh, any of the accounting subnets? You know, maybe, but if they do, why do they? And can we figure out a workaround so that they don't have to, so they don't have to talk directly to each other? Now, an example of that would be like, if, if your legal users in site three um, like to share screens and help each other out with the legal users in site one, maybe you can use some kind of a cloud remote support service so that um, they can still view each other's screens, but they don't have to talk directly back and forth to each other. Um, that would be a workaround so that you could still segment those networks. Now, um, one way to do the network segmentation is to use layer three ACLs at the router level um, to, to block access from each subnet from each other, and then use VLAN ACLs at the switch, la at the switch level um, so that users within the same VLAN can't talk to, to each other in the same VLAN. So in an ideal, in an ideal situation here, your, your legal users in site one um, wouldn't be able to talk to any computers in any of the accounting subnets, any computers in any of the HR subnets, or even any of the um, computers in any of the legal subnets. And, but they, you know, they'd obviously still be able to hit the servers, subnets that they need to hit. And, uh, and, uh, 
you know, they'd obviously need to, you'd, you'd be able to hit the IT subnets too, so they can be managed by IT. So, you know, just thinking about those things, um, you know, if you drop an attacker into an environment where they can't talk to any other user workstations, I think you're going to make their job harder. Um, and if on top of that, you're doing some of these controls to limit credential theft, um, you're going to you're going to make their job even harder. So those, that's the kind of the, the logic there. Some other things you can do to limit uh, credential theft, or specifically lateral, lateral movement in this case. Um, randomize your local admin accounts. Use something like Microsoft Laps or similar. Um, in that that uh, Mimikatz KB, they give you a couple new SIDs, uh, user SIDs. So you can use the local account there where it says S-1-5-113 local account. That's going to be you can you can use that to deny logon, network logon to other systems so that in that first example where you dump credentials and you move laterally with local accounts, that will that will not allow that anymore. That's a huge quick win. If you're not doing that, uh, make sure you go home and do that right away. Also, you can disable LLM and R and NetBIOS if you're familiar with like Responder and how that works. Um, you can you're obviously going to want to limit your service account privileges to as to as little as possible, and use managed service accounts whenever you can. And uh, you you can you're going to want to force NTLM v2. And if you can disable, some people say disable NTLM altogether. Um, I think that's great if you can. Um, not everybody. Um, can probably do that, so you're going to want to at least force NTLM v2. Um, and so it kind of, to kind of wrap up here, um, you know, I hear people talking all the time about these next gen um, appliance or software that stops every threat known to man and <coughs> has machine learning and APT detection and probably wipes your ass and stuff for you too. Um, you know, it's so those uh, sales and marketing people at those companies are really good at what they do. They've got really sexy graphics and everything. And it's so much easier to go buy one of those things, rack it in your network, and then say, "All right, we're good, we're protected. Let's go to lunch, guys." You know, than to really sit down and truly understand the risk that you're dealing with, and um, you know, learning from some of the offensive guys, taking their tools, and trying to learn how they work. Um, things, you know, things like Power up and incognito, and you know, run those things on your own. Uh, Mimi cats, run those on your network, and use them to try to figure out how they work. Not necessarily blocking those tools, but figuring out how those tools work. Um, you know, finding your weak points, building walls, um, set a trip, set as many trip wires as you can, and plug the plug the holes the best you can. So, um, just wanted to say thank you to. A bunch of people on Twitter that put up with me asking dumb questions. Uh, if you're a blue teamer, these are definitely people people to follow. Also, uh, I didn't mention Carlos Perez, but also follow him. A uh, lot of good stuff there. And uh, uh, I also want to mention BreakSec podcast and Defensive Security podcast. Really good stuff if you're a blue teamer. So I don't know if we have any time. I think we've got three minutes for questions. Yes, they, have, they I believe they do get cleared on reboot. Yep. yep. Um, I'm not doing much with V switches. I'm mostly working with physical hardware switches. Um, and actually on this slide deck there's a, a config for VLAN ACLs and that's what I use and if you I'm talking more about more the and having the VLAN that sounds like a kind of a more specific question for you, maybe your organization I I can't I don't I don't have a good answer for that one sorry uh, all right well thanks everybody for coming if you want to